this case takes place in the United Kingdom and spans over many years. Reinhard Senaga, also known as Ray, entered this world on the 19th of February 1983. He was born in Jambi, a bustling city on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. Although he was brought up in Jakarta in West Java, Ray belonged to a well-to-do family with his parents and his two younger brothers. Ethnically, they were part of the Batak people, a prominent Indonesian group known for their adherence to a conservative form of Protestant Christianity. Ray, the eldest among his siblings in a tribal community, carried the weight of providing and looking after his family as per tradition. Growing up as a closeted gay man in Indonesia, a nation with conservative Islamic values, he faced condemnation from his family and tribe for his sexual orientation, compelling him to live a life shrouded in secrecy. Standing at a modest 5 feet in 7 inches, Ray possessed a gentle voice, charismatic smile, and sported thick-rimmed glasses, making him appear unassuming and inoffensive. However, the young man had a drive to break free from his oppressive background and embrace a lifestyle that allowed him to be open about his true self. In 2007, at the age of 24, he completed a degree in architecture at the University of Indonesia. He obtained a student visa and made the life-changing decision to move to Manchester in the UK. His arrival provided him with a long-awaited opportunity to finally lead the life he had been denied for so long. Although, unbeknownst to those who knew Ray, hidden beneath his unassuming exterior was a twisted darkness. This is the face of one of the most infamous rapists in history. The Crown Prosecution Service described Ray as the most prolific rapist in British legal history and possibly even the world's legal history. Ray's student visa allowed him to attend the University of Manchester, where he studied for a postgraduate degree in urban planning, followed by a Master's of Arts in Sociology. Manchester, and more importantly, the surrounding area of the universities, would make the perfect grounds for Ray to be accepted for his homosexuality. Princess Street is the main arterial road stretching from the imposing Victorian Albert Square Town Hall to the vibrant neighbourhoods where Ray strategically rented a flat. The street acts as a cultural dividing line. On one side, Chinatown explodes with colourful signs and enticing food smells. On the other side, the gay village welcomes visitors with the rainbow flag. Further down, the energy intensifies with iconic nightclubs like Factory and Fifth. Manchester has a legendary nightlife, but as a result of this, it has become the habitat for numerous lawbreakers and predators. Ray was known to be relatively outgoing and not very shy when making new friends. In 2008, Sarah, a pseudonym to protect her identity, crossed paths with Ray. In an interview with the BBC, Sarah stated that she knew Ray during his initial days as a student. She admitted that she shared the same circle of friends, but clarified that she was never particularly close with him. She claimed that Ray seemed to receive ample attention from other homosexual men and was quick to engage in flirting. Despite this, Sarah goes on to say that he never appeared to be the sort of individual who sought out any wild parties. He presented himself as friendly, quietly confident and unassuming. His vanity was notable evidenced by the meticulous attention he gave to his appearance. Sarah believed that his unique looks made him stand out within the gay community, ending the interview by saying that he had a preference for masculine men, and that he regularly boasted about his power to turn heterosexual men gay. However, this power he had was something far more sinister. Ray's comfortable life in Manchester was funded in part by his wealthy palm oil baron father, though he also juggled studies with part-time jobs. One such position in a bar located within Manchester's gay village placed him at the centre of the community he would later target. During an interview, one of his old bosses described Ray as no less than an exceptional employee, consistently ranking him among the best. He said that Ray came across as polite, efficient, spoke perfect English and rarely missed a shift. He was known as the smiley, happy-go-larry self-proclaimed posh spice. 
This was the same nice guy picture painted by most people who came close to him. However, his boss continued and said that they found his constant eye contact and smile was at times unsettling, suggesting a hidden, manipulative quality. This unnerving characteristic she emphasized made the revelation of his true nature even more horrifying. Ray's hunting ground wasn't far from his modest flat in Montana House on Princess Street. After spending all day working or studying, Ray would position himself near his window, surveying the streets. Ray had a keen eye for masculine, muscly, tall, strong men, but he preferred them to be intoxicated and alone. When an opportunity arose, Ray would emerge, not only with a smile, but with a predatory glint in his eyes. He wasn't interested in deploying his so-called power of attraction, or seeking any genuine connection. Instead, he would either stalk a possible victim, or lurk around late night takeaways, waiting to exploit innocent bystanders' vulnerabilities. His sinister and calculated approach saw him portray himself as a saviour, a good Samaritan offering a safe haven. For intoxicated individuals desperate to charge a dead phone, or to reconnect with friends, or who didn't want the night to end there, Ray's flat seemed like a lifeline. On the surface, to many, it seemed like a reasonable offer from a meek and overly kind individual. Tragically, this manipulative tactic proved effective on multiple occasions. CCTV footage shows that on one occasion, Ray slips onto the street and catches a very drunk person and heads back to his flat together. He did this in under 60 seconds. Once inside his flat, Ray seamlessly transitioned from the role of a lurking predator to that of a gracious host, offering a seat and refreshments and very rarely causing suspicion. If the victim could navigate through his filthy flat, making sure not to knock off one of his many fridge magnets, Ray would showcase his wide range of alcoholic beverages. Vodka, tequila, rum, gin, whiskey, he had a drink for everyone, whatever their preference. Ray would present a chosen drink laced with a substance, a substance like gamma hydroxybutyrate, otherwise known as GHB, known for its use as a 1990s anaesthetic. On the streets, it is sometimes known as liquid ecstasy, Gina or G. It is readily available on the streets of Manchester and online. Essentially, GHB works in the brain and acts a little bit like alcohol, but if you take too much, you can become very sleepy, like a sedative, sometimes leading to a complete unconscious state. Studies on this drug show that it has a negative effect on one's memory. This shows that Ray has done his research, and this was a key part of the puzzle which allowed him to continue his 10-year spree. As a result, it is said that Ray's victims are still out there, perhaps with a vague suspicion that something very strange happened one night out in Manchester. But perhaps they have no idea at all. Unfortunately, this is where the case takes a turn for the worst. Once the spiked drink was digested, the otherwise strong victims were left defenceless. Next, Ray would position a couple of covers and blankets on the floor to create what looks like a bed. Once made, he would negotiate the unconscious body of his victim, place them face down with trousers and pants rolled down to knee height. Next, Ray, fully naked by this point, would set up his white iPhone 4, so that himself and his victims are front and center in preparation for what is to come next. The moment he had been waiting for. With his second black iPhone 6 in hand, Ray would repeatedly and viciously force himself upon the victim over and over again. For many of his victims, Ray did not stop. He would prolong the assault for up to several hours, sometimes with a break, but sometimes without. He would force himself upon the sedated, unconscious victim, all the while filming the ordeal so he may gain further satisfaction at a later date. Taking videos and photographs meant that Ray could continue to violate and gain gratification from taking something from his victims and owning it indefinitely. In the absence of a concrete timeline marked by dates and times, unraveling the dark saga of Ray's prolific assault spree becomes an intricate task. 
His spree was on an unprecedented scale, with over 200 victims. It's difficult to know where to even begin. With the nature of these crimes and the methodology of sedation and predation of men, victims either can't recall or don't want to recall the events. Although, numerous victims have gone on to record giving their versions of events. As part of an interview with a man who shall be named Robert to hide his identity recalled his story. It was a typical night out for Robert. He arrived at a takeaway at the end of a night out partying and was looking to charge his phone. He asked one of the workers of the takeaway if they could charge his phone whilst he waited for his food order, but this conversation was overheard by Ray. Ray shouted in response, I've got a flat round the corner, you can charge your phone there if you want, it's only a 5 minute walk away. So Robert thought, why not? He mentioned in the interview that he could handle himself, and he saw no feasible threat in Ray. So Robert went back to Ray's flat, put his phone on charge, and sat there. He described Ray's flat as the average university accommodation, nothing made him think he had something sinister going on. Ray went into action, offering him all sorts of drinks from his wide variety. Robert politely declined these attempts, saying that Ray was not someone he would particularly like to socialise or drink with. He wanted his phone charged and to be off. Robert explained that Ray was persistent and offered a beverage a second time, this time with a range of different drinks. At this point, Robert thought that something was a little bit off. So after 15 minutes, with 5% juice on his phone, he made the wise decision to leave. On his way out, he politely exchanged numbers with Ray. However, he states that he was not interested in contacting him in the future. His name in the phone book was saved as Creepy Ray. For Robert, it is a tale of narrow escape. His fate rested on having a casual drink with a stranger. Where many may have left intact as Robert did, so many did not. Ray's exploits continued. A second man who shall not be named had crossed paths with Ray, and in an interview he stated the following. We were out for a night out at Factory Night Club, and in the early hours I lost my three friends, so I went outside to see if I could contact them. Ten minutes passed, and while I was outside, Mr. Sinaga came up to me and asked me how I was, who I was, and why I was outside. As a fellow student, I thought he was just looking out for me. Checking a fellow student was alright. We started talking for 10-15 minutes. Once that happened, he offered me inside, into his flat, to keep warm, while I waited to contact my friends. There seemed to be no problem with it. I followed him inside, and went with him into the flat, where we were still chatting about school, college and university. I just thought, students helping each other out in Manchester. It's a big city, we were helping each other out. Then, when I went inside, this is when he offered me a drink, two drinks. I went to the toilet, as by this point I'd had a few drinks, and I needed a wee. I've come back to his living room, he had two shots, a red one and a see-through one. I took two shots. I took one straight after the other. Then, from that point on, I don't have any recollection still to this day. Until six o'clock in the morning, that's when I woke up and found him on top of me. In a chilling exchange on WhatsApp in July of 2015, Ray informed a friend that his flatmate was moving out. Excited by the prospect, the friend responded, Well now, you can get lots of straight boys in. Ray callously replied by sending a photograph of his latest victim, who was unconscious, faced down, and defiled. Accompanied by the message, you mean like this one? As mentioned earlier, Ray liked to boast about his ability to turn straight men gay, so this became a joke within his friendship group. Unbeknownst to his friends, these hookups were actually his victims. The friend replied, There's always a new one. You have a different straight guy every week. Ray told his friends in the WhatsApp group that he had picked up a man the previous night who had argued with his girlfriend in the nightclub factory. 
he boasted by saying, Super Ray saves straight boys from their monstrous girlfriends, sending along a photograph of his unconscious victim. One friend replied, Finally, I can see inside of Ray's room. I was always forbidden to go behind that magic door. You were always screaming, No, it's too messy. The jokes continued over his skills in pulling straight men, and in his secrecy of his personal life. One friend even joked, saying that the bodies were piling up under his bed. To commit a crime so appalling is one thing, but to detach completely, seeking an undeserved ego boost, and joking to friends keeping the true nature of the events hidden is a different level. His sociopathy and narcissism was going unchecked. On the surface, his narcissism and somewhat naive personality made some people think of him as a bit of a Peter Pan character, not looking his age, when in reality, he was one of the worst criminals that Britain has ever seen. Amongst these violations, Ray had some intermittent, short, and chaotic relationships. One of Ray's close female friends recalled that he had a boyfriend who worked at the Ibis Hotel opposite his flat on Princess Street. Working long hours and not having the availability as expected of Ray, the relationship ended. Ray did not cope well with rejection. His friends claimed that Ray threatened his ex-boyfriend. He told his boyfriend he would hurt himself and drink bleach, in a sick attempt to blackmail his alleged lover. By 2017, Ray's exploits reigned for 10 years, and at this point, he was commuting to the University of Leeds to study for his PhD with a thesis title, Sexuality and Everyday Transnationalism Among South Asian Gay and Bisexual Men in Manchester. He failed his PhD, and he continued his disturbing spree. That would be until 6am on the 2nd of June 2017. One man who shall not be named after leaving Ray's flat one cold morning rang 999. With a trembling panic in his voice, he managed to say the words, Hello, I just, I think some guy just tried to rape me after he took me to his house and I didn't want to. Of course, the call handler's priority was the man's immediate safety. But then asked if he met him last night, the man followed up with, Yeah, I met him last night, I think. I was drinking, and he ended up, well, he slipped me something, I don't know, and now in the morning he's on top of me, like, trying to, you know what. Even in that moment, when the man was bravely recounting the events, he could still not explicitly say what Ray was doing to him. From this man's account, it's clear to see how even just the next day, events are foggy from the sedatives. The call continued, with the handler asking for the name of the perpetrator. The man said, I don't know his name at all, I just know where his house is, and he hasn't left his house since I escaped from it. He continued, stating that when he came round from his unconscious state, he very quickly tried to punch and push Ray away. In a panic, he tried to explain why he had blood on his hands. The man had beaten Ray to a pulp. Within 10 minutes of receiving the police report, officers arrived on the scene. They found one man claiming victimization and another semi-unconscious. Ray was on the floor with excessive volumes of blood all around him. Because Ray was so badly injured, the original male who placed the emergency call was arrested. Ray was carried out of his flat down Princess Road on a stretcher and rushed to Manchester Royal Infirmary. This left the police in a real pickle. Who do they believe? Ray was in hospital in a critical state and his attacker was literally sitting with blood on his hands. However, it wasn't long before the appalling truth unfolded. Ray was in and out of consciousness, but despite his dire condition, he was hellbent on knowing the whereabouts of his mobile phone. Detective Inspector Matt Gregory was the first officer to visit Ray whilst he was in hospital. Medical staff passed on that Ray was having waves of distress trying to find his mobile phone. Gregory had scanned the medical bay and found his phone under the bed. What was perplexing to the officers was that Ray, desperate to get onto his phone, gave the officer the incorrect pin to unlock it for him. Could this be due to a head injury, or was Ray hiding whatever was on his phone? Undeterred by these apparent games, the officer persisted and eventually received the code 
and unlocked Ray's mobile phone. In that moment, Ray conjured the ability to move and attempted to strike the mobile phone out of the hand of the officer. The officer became incredibly suspicious, so he went straight to the photograph application and it was at this point that the cat was out of the bag. The officer was faced immediately with three disturbing thumbnails of an explicit naked male. He continued, knowing this information could be pivotal in the investigation. He watched three videos, much like many of the other film footage they would later find. A scene where a male lying face down and clothed had their trousers and underwear forcibly pulled down to their knees. In a harrowing turn, a naked individual identified as Ray approached the victim on the floor and proceeded to force himself upon them. In an unexpected turn of events, the man who was currently in police custody for grievous bodily harm charges was telling the truth. In the officer's hands was the footage of the male being continuously essayed by Ray. The case was flipped and the right man was then arrested. The man that police had in custody was released. Once released and the shock of the incident had begun to subside, the man went into his back pocket to access his phone. It was at this point he realised the phone he had picked up when scrambling out of the door of Ray's flat was in fact Ray's second mobile phone. He handed this phone to the police as evidence immediately. After scouring his primary phone, secondary phone and other hard drives found in his flat, it was discovered that Ray had over three terabytes of explicit photographs and videos of over 200 men that he had essayed or forced himself upon all drugged, all unconscious, every video analysed by a team of police. To put this into perspective, the amount of footage that Ray had filmed would need to be stored on 1,500 DVDs. This was the work of a master manipulator, a young Indonesian male who gained the power through illegal substances to inflict pain and suffering to hundreds of young men. The case was aptly named Operation Island. Recovered from his residence at Montana House on Princess Street gave the chilling backdrop to each of his vile acts. Adjacent to his bed were a trove of trophies, including stored phones, driving licenses, student ID cards, watches and wallets, all belonging to the men who he had violated. The Greater Manchester Police claims that the total amount of victims now stands at 206 substantiated by digital, physical and corroborative evidence. On the 28th of September 2018, the trial began. As the investigation continued and the first round of court hearings began, the prosecutors managed to make 48 victims the willing focal point of the case. A small percentage of the 206 uncovered during Operation Island. Approximately 60 people tragically could not be identified from the evidence, however, a further 80 men were identified and approached, but they did not want to go through as a victim in the trial. Throughout this time, many victims approached by the police quickly became very, very angry, often wondering why the police were telling them something that they had no knowledge of. Some men were dismissive and some were completely emotionless, but many became extremely emotional, as if the revelation of what happened to them without them knowing was unveiled and all the effects hit them at once. As if the trauma afflicted during the actual essay was buried within the consciousness, only to emerge once told. Over 70 of the victims sought help to address and overcome their assaults. Many saw relationship breakdowns with families and loved ones as their mental health and self-esteem were crushed. Several found it difficult being physical again, and some wanted to take their own lives. The trial was a lengthy process and amounted to four separate trials, a difficult task for the Crown Prosecutor Ian Rushton. As in a case like this, it is difficult not to present the 48 victims like a conveyor belt, dehumanising them as Victim 19, Victim 20, Victim 21, as there were just so many. All of the victims had to relive the events during the trial watching the videos which showed them being brutally assaulted by Ray, as he looked onwards at them and the jury, smiling throughout. Whenever a victim was asked if they were in the video, 
Ray's eyes would laser focus onto the victim, and when the victim said yes, a visible sense of euphoria and satisfaction could be seen in Ray's face, as if he was being allowed to violate them once more. Ludicrously, the defense counselor attempted to create a narrative that the encounters were consensual. The defense counselor asked the victims whether they were interested in roleplay, whether they felt sexy being filmed, and whilst he would ask the victims these questions, he played the footage of them being essayed on screen. A truly diabolical and traumatic ordeal, the defense lawyer almost had the same lack of emotion as Ray, having no visible remorse and no emotional attachment to what was going on in that courtroom. Ray's defense, claiming consensual engagement in his fantasy scenarios, was unanimously rejected by all four juries. The prosecution, anticipating the gravity of the crimes, argued for a whole life sentence, a rare occurrence outside of mandatory life sentence cases. Ray was found guilty, however, the judge overseeing the case ultimately sentenced Ray to life in prison, but with a minimum term of 30 years before parole consideration. The judge described Ray as dangerous, deeply disturbed, and a perverted individual with no sense of reality. For many of the victims, this news did not scratch the surface of beginning to recover from what had happened to them. However, some did find some form of solace. The gentleman who managed to escape and called the emergency services was glad that he got some form of payback, having beaten Ray to near death and ultimately stopped his predation for good. This has allowed him to block out the events and take the brave steps forward to recovering and getting on with his life. He stated that Ray wanted to destroy us, but that we the victims need to come out and say it is not our fault, it was his fault. After the sentencing, a revelation emerged. 23 men stepped forward, 12 were already known to investigators, but remarkably 11 were previously unknown victims, casting a sobering light on the reach of Ray's crimes. Shortly after, Solicitor General Michael Ellis expressed profound dissatisfaction with the sentencing, after inflicting what he referred to as an ocean of harm. Despite the judge initially deeming the case not warranting a whole life tariff, a pivotal hearing in October of 2020 prompted a reconsideration. At this hearing, the severity of Ray's crimes could not be overlooked or downplayed. As a result, his sentence was increased from 30 years to 40 years, a decision intended to reflect the gravity of the crimes committed. This adjustment ensures that Ray's fate will rest in the hands of the parole board in 2060, at which time he will be 77 years old.